Welcome to Couture Pages, where we talk to black creatives all across the fashion industry. I'm your host, Paige. We are here today talking to the creative directors of Armstrong & Wilson, Ontario and Clifton. Let's go have a talk. My name is Ontario Armstrong, and I'm co-owner of Armstrong & Wilson. My name is Clifton Wilson, and co-owner of Armstrong & Wilson. So with Armstrong & Wilson, we started um, back in 2009 with men's accessories, but it was the pocket square we started with first, and the button became our signature piece for us. And um, we started with the button because it was something that, with me working at Nordstrom's, and I was in the men's suit department, that was one thing where guys always wanted to wear a pocket square, but they would say, oh, it's going to fall down inside a jacket. So the button became a signature piece where it just clipped on at the top of the suit pocket and it just never falls down. So that became our signature piece uh, started back in 2009. So how did you guys meet? Uh, it feels like forever ago. Cliff and I met back in 2000. I had just moved here from uh, North Carolina. Not many people know that's where I'm originally from. Mm -hmm. So we met at the Art Institute of Philadelphia. Uh, and Art mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and it's crazy, most of our, we both school for fashion design, so, and most of our classes, usually we were the only guys. Mm -hmm. And, I don't know, we just like, we, you know, we both just gravitated towards one another. We kind of both had our ideas of, you know, we both wanted to be entrepreneurs, we wanted to have our own business. Um, and I don't know, we just clicked from there, so it was like from day one, we were both like, alright, let's have our own brand. And it, it, it went from there. You know, my school years were right. Oh yeah. I went to more college for writing design. Oh. That's yeah, right around right, right. <laughs> You know we were rivals. I was an all girls school, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I was a bunch of rivals though, you know. I don't know. We were better. <laughs> Probably was. Right? Yeah, yeah. Not sure. Our institute was the worst school. That's true. I always tell you, I think for me like the best thing that came out of the Art Institute was just meeting Cliff, like mm -hmm. outside of that was dead. <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's about it. But uh, I mean, I think one thing about you know, you know, for us, it's just again, like we both just had this desire to have our own. So you know, it was just an easy fit when he and I came together. So you know, you know, people people look at Armstrong and Wilson as if this is something that just started like overnight. But Cliff and I, this is like over 20 years of friendship, over 20 years of ups and downs. So you know, we kind of bonded at the hip, you know what I mean? Both of you are pretty young, youngish, young adjacent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Compared, compared to our, you know, our old school friend brands yeah. that we all know and love. Um, what, got, what got you guys into wanting to do pocket squares and other luxury men accessories? Um, I think initially, like, you know, working at Norris was like, it's a lot different now. When we worked at Nordstrom's, like everyone had to wear a suit. Like, I don't care if you worked in sportswear, I don't care if you worked in the bathing suit department, whatever, like you had to wear a suit. So for us, it was just, you know, we were always into fashion. I just think once we got to Nordstrom's, like our, our idea of fashion became a little more elevated. And we were just like, okay, what can we do to kind of complement what we already wear? Uh, and I think at that time, like men were kind of getting back to where they were adding those extra details to their look. And um, we just saw it as an opportunity. Also around that time, uh, right around we started, right around the time we started to with the idea of Armstrong and Wilson, Cliff was in uh, Esquire magazine, mm -hmm. which kind of, I'll let you tell you more about Yeah, that. no, with, with um, I, mean, I guess it touched based on like the whole pocket square and, and, and the fashion was, I'm 40 now, mm -hmm. when I was, 17, I got my first job at a tuxedo store. So, suits and pocket squares always been all I knew, honestly. Because um, I used to dress guys for weddings and, and proms at the tuxedo store called Smalls Formula. And then that turned into black tie. And so, from 17, um, I've just always been into suits and tuxedos and, and, and those accessories. So but all you know is peak lapels all and, I, and horse hair and yeah, yeah, exactly. horse hair. Horse and horse and horse and side. Yeah. Not to cut him off though, but I will give him credit. Yeah. He was the first one to get me in my first suit. What? Uh, so, <laughs> that's, that's, 
<laughs> no, you know what? So I, I can't, I'm not going to front and act like this is all I've ever known. So this is right before I first started working with Norris. So I'll give you credit for that. He came to me because I was at work at a tuxedo store. And when I was working at this tuxedo store, I never knew about quality clothes. Mm -hmm. You know, this was tuxedo rooms. You know, so I used to just do all the wedding parties and everything like that. And Ontario came to me and said, yo, I got this job at this place called Nordstrom's and um, I need a suit. Now, at the time, I will, I will always go to um, the thrift store mm -hmm. and buy a suit for about $10, $15, and I would take it to my teller uh, and have them recut the suit and teller just for me. Mm -hmm. So then that suit would look like a custom teller fitted suit. That is an amazing months, idea. You know? <laughs> but I've been doing that when I was like 18, 19 years old. So that was always my uh, thing. And when Ontario came to me, say I got this job at Nordstrom's, I need a suit. I said, all right, well, let's go to this thrift store. Let's grab a suit, take it to this teller, and get it fitted. And once he put Nordstrom's into my ear, he was like, yo, you should try to come up and get a job here. I never knew about it. I never heard about it. Um, you know, because I was accustomed to buying thrift store suits or clothes and accustomed to um, a place called Shirt Corner Plus where you can get five suits <laughs> for forty nine ninety nine and a ham sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what I was accustomed to. So oh, a fifteen hundred dollar suit was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, yeah. and you're working on commission, right? <laughs> so when I first started at Nordstrom's, I went to the only department I knew with suits. Mm -hmm. And it was an eye opener to me because it was pretty much like I started dressing CEOs and men and, and guys who were like, yo, I need three suits. And these suits would be $2,000 a piece and Hickey Freeman, Canali, Zinnias, and Zanella Slacks. And I was like, wow, people are spending this much money on suits. Like, I love the Zanella pants. <laughs> It was, it was that thing, so when it opened my eyes up to it, North, I, I always had dressing and, and suits in my heart, but Nordstrom really opened the whole quality and customer service, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of what kind of sparked the interest of saying we need to do something on our own to kind of complement these $2,000 suits, these, these accessories, mm -hmm. and, um, and it, it started with the smallest piece that complemented the, the pocket square. That's all we could really afford was to make something like the pocket square. You know? $50 for a yard bag, like 20 months ago. Yeah. Okay. Make it work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we did. We did just cover this. But once again, let's just, you know, kind of reiterate what sets you guys' pocket squares um, apart from the rest. Um, for us, it was again like it was always that signature detail with our button. Um, I think you know you can lay a hundred pocket squares on the table, and nothing you know could compare to what we've done with our pocket square. And initially, you know, for us when we started out, we wanted to kind of go away from the traditional fabrics like the silks and things like that. You know, we wanted to use fabrics that most people didn't use. So you know, cashmere, wool, uh, linen. Uh, really like elevated cottons. And then even just like the piping of our pocket square, you know, we wanted to do something that was really bold, that would stand out. Because, right, for us, like our, our idea was we wanted people to build their wardrobe around the pocket square. Mm -hmm. You know, most guys come in, okay, give me a suit, the tie. Like we wanted people to come in and say, hey, I have this pocket square. I want you to find the suit, shoes, shirt and everything to go back to this pocket square. So we wanted just to make that the focal point of everything. So for us, again, it was that detail. And it was just something a little playful and it was a conversation piece when people saw it. It was like, oh, like, wow, that's different. And it, you know, it functions. And we always tell our guys, like, you can wear it with the button showing, you can wear it without it showing. You can, you know, fluff it and just throw it in your jacket. You know, we wanted to make something that was, that was, you know, appealing to the eye, but also that had that versatility. You guys just mentioned that you worked at Nordstrom's and coincidentally they are one of your biggest retailers. How did you guys land that deal? Um, that's just a lot of uh, friends at Nordstrom, man. Like the product was uh, pretty much selling itself, but I would say we did for about a year, two years, we did trunk shows. And it was really, uh, it was, and you know, I love it. it was Zoe. It was Zoe who fought for us 
uh, and, and King of Prussia, who really got the door open to host our first trunk show. Um, in there, but you know, with friends like Brahma and Zoe, um, you know, even Joanne, they pretty much helped. You know, started wearing the merchandise, promoting the merchandise and started getting you know the, the, the buzz out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that was that's the turning point to where the brand started really to grow into its own because customers were coming to Marshall and say, hey, where's that pocket square with the button on it? Where is yeah. this you know brand? And um, that started opening up the doors but we flew from you know California to the Jerseys to the you know uh, Georgia, um, Charlotte, we drove to Florida. Yeah, we drove to Florida, to you know, yeah. just to promote the brand and get it out there before we got any purchase order. And all this was on Kasan, you know. Wow. So you have to kind of have the the passion to do it. You have to have the, the whole um, dedication behind your brand and know, like, okay, we're going to fly out here for free. We're going to drop here for free, and hopefully, whatever we sell, you know, Norsons take their cut, we take our cut, and we did all of that, you know. Pay for the hotels and the airfares and the gas, you know, we got behind the brand. And I think that was a bigger part because, like, oftentimes, like, when you see these brands in these trunk shows, like, the reps are just there. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you don't get the owners. Yeah. But for us, like, every trunk show, it was he and I. Um, and I remember, like, this is right before we had our meeting with Seattle. They they were like, all right, we want you to do our number two soldiers in Chicago. Yeah. Because that was like their their monster. And they were like, okay, if they can kill it in Michigan Chicago. Or yeah, they can kill it on Michigan yeah. Ave. Then we talked about something. So we went there and we're like, they're like, okay, if you guys can kill here, then you went to the finals. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was like the semi-final. Yeah. You kill here, you go into the finals. You went to Chicago and I think like we had some crazy, you know, and we're outside like Burberry accessories like that, like it was just killing them. So after that, they were like, all right, cool, like, let's set up this meeting in Seattle. And we went out there and they started us off with like 25, 30 stores. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, initially. So yeah, I mean, it was just like, it was really just like organic, a lot of just like Cliff and I just out there just making it happen. I mean, there were, there were times we were doing trunk shows even separately. Mm -hmm. Like he would be out in California doing a trunk show and I would be out in DC and we'd be doing it the same day. Mm -hmm. So it was just, yeah, it was just, and it's just awesome. like Cliff said, it was on our dog. Mm -hmm. You know, we wanted to show them that we really, you, you know, were really behind our brand. Yeah, yeah. And then I think too, because we worked there, it was just like, it was a it was a great store, like two former employees. Like, it's almost like, like look how Norris was treated. Give mm -hmm. the opportunities they give their employees. And it also helps that you know the culture, so exactly. you knew how to talk to the customers, yeah. Yeah. you knew what to yeah. say, yeah. and that also helps a lot when trying to sell yeah. certain, right. a particular merchandise, which a lot of people yeah. do not know. Yeah. It was so like, it was so weird, like I wanted to go in and put in my employee number, I was so used to being in the door, went to the screen, <laughs> like, yeah. you know? <laughs> right. yeah. But is it also kind of a, when your hand, you're pretty much hands-on, you know. One one thing I learned is when, when I was traveling to different commercials is you're listening to the customer, mm -hmm. and then you can take their feedback back to you know your studio and create something that you know you can really give out to you know the uh, customer. You know, so that's that's something I really love taking from the traveling and to, you know just learning what the employees like, mm -hmm. what the customers like. Because I spent a lot of my time on that floor mm -hmm. at Marshall selling. Not Armstrong or Wilson, but this is before the branding, you know, came about, and you never really got a chance to really speak to the owners or you know the designers. Mm -hmm. You'll speak to a rep, but then the rep has really no understanding about okay, what's next to come. Mm -hmm. You know, they so, want to know numbers. They want to make sure their product yeah. is selling. And it's that's it. Yeah, they want to know hey, <laughs> my product's gonna be on the shelf, this and that. But to actually hear the feedback from the customer and then go back and design yeah. something, you know, according to what they one, you know, that's what I love the most. Yes. And what that does for the employee also, it gives, it puts a face behind the brand. Yeah. So now, like, when they think of, like, when you're not there, they think about, they think about selling a pocket square. The first brand that comes to mind is Marshall and Wilson. Oh, I met these guys. They're cool. They're down to earth. Mm -hmm. I can either sell this whatever pocket square, or I can take them to Armstrong and Wilson. Let me take them over to Armstrong and Wilson. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, like how do you maintain such a relationship with them? Like how do you cultivate it? Um, just 
I don't, I mean, it's, it's so easy these days to maintain because everyone's on Facebook, everyone's on Instagram and all, and just being out there. I mean, I would fly to Seattle for an hour meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, like literally jump on a plane, five o'clock in the morning, land for an hour meeting with the buyers. And they come back. And they come back <laughs> yeah. to Philly. Mm -hmm. You know, like just that, just like that. And I think when you have that kind of relationship with them, I think it started to open up uh, you know, the dialect to say, okay, they're really behind their brand because anybody's going to drop. I mean, you can Skype a meeting for 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can do these things. You can just send the merchandise out and go ahead and let me know. But to fly out there and then when you're traveling to all these different North shows, and that's probably why we know a lot of the, uh, not just the buyers, but a lot of the uh, managers and all these different departments. You know, when we go out there to these events, we're going out to dinner with these managers, we're going out to dinner with the buyers. You know, you become friends, you know, and they yeah. see you, you know, through social media and then like, hey, you're in Philly, let's take you out to dinner, let's go out to dinner, let's hang out, you know. So that's always been, you know, our thing is just that personal, uh, relationship. Everything else that happens to be about business all the time. You know, and I think that's when you have the best relationships, when you have a genuine relationship. Like, I actually like this person. We can actually hang out and not talk about business, not talk about purchase orders, not talk about commercials, but we're actually hanging out, enjoying ourselves. You know, I had an amazing time in Arizona. And um, I hung out with, you know, North people, and um, I don't think I ever got that drunk in my life. But was <laughs> <laughs> not drunk in my pocket squares. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, you know, like, it was a great time, but it's because we mm -hmm. were real. Yes. You know, and I think when you make that de facto point, like, look, we had a great time, and it was, it was fun. But that's true. Like, I think. That's the biggest thing when it comes to, to Cliff and I. Like, at least I like to think like when people meet us, they're just like, y'all guys are some stuffy dudes and suits. You know what I mean? Like you got, we can laugh, we can joke. Like, like let's it's all fun. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, like yeah, you know we want to move our product, but it's just pocket school. You know what I mean? It's just like let's let's cultivate these relationships and build on that. And when people see that, they're like, yo, these are some good dudes. I just. I think it's just make, make those relationships a lot stronger. It's a yeah. lot. It, in my personal experience, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's like, they're yeah. not going to be all, you know, we sell 15 yeah. million puppets. Yeah, you know, we're going to be just floating across the floor <laughs> like Jamaica. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. like, yeah. like, hey, <laughs> let's take shots. Right. You know, save yourself pocket squares. Right. Exactly. They're awesome. Yeah. That's what it was. It's pretty much like, hey, you're in town, you know no one. The only family you got, because since you have that Norsham culture embedded in you, mm -hmm. you understand that when you're part of Norsham, when you work for Norsham, you become part of this Norsham's family. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a city that you've never been in before, you're only gravitating to the Norsham's people you're with. And they're like, hey, you know, you guys in the city, let's hang out. Because mm -hmm. whenever we did these trunk shows, it was on a Friday or Saturday. Yeah. And those are the nights that, all right, we're leaving North at 10 o'clock at night, everybody's closed up, we're going to meet you down in the town, we're going to meet you in the city. We're going to let your hair down. Yeah, yeah, let your hair down. You know, so that's what I mean. I let my hair all the way down. I let my hair all the way down. I've been down. I've been in a couple of cities. <laughs> we are now in the midst of a global pandemic, which, like, has affected everybody in its own little special way. What has been your biggest drawback that affected your business during the COVID-19? <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, there are a number of things, but I think a lot of it is just like people's priorities have shifted in terms of like how they spend. I think that, I think for us, it's just really being able to pivot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything now is, online you know for us where you know we're so used to again doing trunk shows being face to face mm -hmm. um, all those things like it's really you know we can't you can't move like you used to um, you, know, you can't do trunk shows and trade shows and things the way that you used to do them whereas like you know those are the big marketplaces where people come they buy for the next season they're shopping you don't have that face to face interaction anymore so for us, it's just like now figuring out ways to, to really build our e-commerce and just do it completely different. I think everybody who's in business, from the, from the big people to the small, are really just, they took a hit. 
you know, and they're really just trying to figure out, because it's never gonna go back to the way that it used to be. Like we'll never, retail and shopping will never be what we knew it to be. Mm -hmm. So I think for, again, like bigger brands, smaller brands, like the challenge is like, what's the new way? Like what's the mindset of the customer? And how are they gonna shop now? And how do we get ahead of that to be ready for it? You know, because it's not like we, companies had time to prep for this. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh, like, we got a year to figure this out because we, we, we know this pandemic is coming. It's like, right away, okay, you can't leave your home. Your store has to shut down. It's like, people don't even, it's weird, it's like people don't even want to shake hands anymore. Mm -hmm. like, people don't want to, you can't hug, you know. It's, it's just so weird, so I think those are like, hey, yeah, it's just like, yeah. hey, you know, I ain't seen you in 10 years, but it's like, I can't hug you, I can't, you know, you get this fake little pound, and you just, <laughs> so it's just like, I think for us, it's like, those have been like one of the, the bigger challenges, like really trying to operate and change our e-commerce platform, just really just navigating this new wave of business. Yeah, I mean, of course, for, for us, when people, think of Armstrong and Wilson, they're buying our product for some kind of event. You know, if they're wearing a, a, a suit, they're not really just wearing a suit just to go to, you know, Rite Aid or anything like that, you know what I mean? So, all the events have been shut down, everything's been canceled, so we took the major hit, of course, with, you know, people don't really need a pocket square, people don't really need a tie, people don't really need, you know, the accessories um, to go to that event, you know, they're not going into a work building anymore, everyone's working from home, you know. Um, so I think with us just being able to understand that and, and say, okay, we know like, um, you know, the, 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 the norm now is online. The norm now is going to be people at home, everybody's social distancing. Uh, so with, with that, it's just, you know, the face mask became, you know, pretty much the new norm. The face mask is your tie. The face mask is, you know, your your pocket square. Now people can showcase their personality, not by, you know, you can't see their smile anymore, so they put a face mask, you know, that's gonna cover 50% of your face on, and that's your new norm now. So to be able to pivot from, okay, overnight, let's switch from hair to switch from there, I think that's what's, you know, going to, you know, always keep keep us afloat. We're small enough to make those pivots. Yeah. And when you're able to create something, you know, like on your own, for instance, like if China shut down right now, how many brands will be able to stay afloat if you can't pivot within? Yeah. You know, so we're small enough to pivot within where you're not large enough to where if, you know, China shut down or these manufacturers shut down, you're now like, okay, what, you know, what kind of yeah. product we're going to do right yeah, now. That's true. So I think that's where you have to kind of know, like, okay, you have to forecast the, the, the you know, your, your whole outcome. And I think with us, we're pretty much, okay, with the face mask not just being your right face mask, but being a dressy mm -hmm. face mask to go with a pocket square, to go with, you know, uh, bow ties and things. I think that's pretty much like the new norm right now to dress it up. And when this pandemic leaves, you're still gonna have guys who now like, hey, you know, it's gonna be middle of winter. Let's wear a face mask just to keep the cold off our face, you know. But I wanted to be dressing to go with our suits, dressing to go with things like that. So that's where I see yeah, it's kind of sure. maneuvering right now. Um, and I don't think that'll ever go away. To be honest, like I think yeah. even when this is over, or you know, people feel like it's over, like mean, there's still going to be this like. Like mentally, like we're in a place where there, there's still fear. Mm -hmm. So even when people are just like, oh, things are better, like that fear is still there, so we're still gonna wear masks. You know what I mean? Like yeah. anywhere you go now, I think that like things like this are gonna be a staple. Uh, because just like Cliff said, like, you know, figuring out a way to pivot, because now like most of the people do meetings on Zoom mm -hmm. and all they care about is dressing up the top porch and they, you know, men, they throw a dress shirt on and that's it. So, you know, for us, it was just like, yeah, really figuring out those angles and like, you know, what's gonna be the next hit, you know, moving forward.